This is episode 268 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I'm very pleased to be joined this week by Representative Greg Nybert. Welcome to Tipping Point New Mexico, Greg. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure being with you this day. Yeah, now uh, first, uh, let's talk a little bit about yourself. You are a, a Republican from the Roswell area. And uh, what uh, what number of terms have you been in? Is this your second go round in the roundhouse? This will be my third term. I uh, was first elected in uh, 2016. So I entered office uh, in January of 2017. And so this will be my, my third uh, full term that I've served in the New Mexico House of Representatives. Um, I, I served District 59, which is basically Western Chavez County and most of Lincoln County, except for the Rio Dosa, Rio Dosa Downs area. And it uh, gets all the all the rural parts of uh, Lincoln County, and then uh, basically everything west of Main Street in Roswell, uh, except for the historic district. Got it. And you uh, are an attorney by by training, right? Yes, I'm a oil and gas lawyer. I've uh, been practicing oil and gas law since uh, 1983. So I've been been around the block a few times and been on the oil and gas roller coaster more times than I would like to admit. <laughs> yeah, well, um, relative to where we've been, things seem to be looking up in the oil patch a little bit, at least uh, $50 a barrel oil uh, is where things seem to be at these days. So it's better than uh, has been or was most of 2020. I don't know if uh, that means 2021 is turning a corner or, or what, but it, it's uh, improvement, right? Well, let's hope for, for many things that we have turned corners so that 2020 can be uh, well in the rearview mirror. Uh, but yes, it looks like uh, the oil and gas industry uh, is receiving a little bit higher commodity prices for its uh, uh, production. The, uh, you know, we, we see these spot prices and we think that's what the producers in New Mexico are receiving. That's not quite accurate. Uh, the producers here actually uh, have a discount applied to their production due to transportation and, and other factors. But uh, certainly a spot price of $50 is better than a spot price of $20. And uh, the producers hopefully see some stability in pricing and see some stability to make uh, decisions to deploy capital and hopefully make decisions to deploy capital in, in New Mexico. Yeah, well, we can definitely talk a little bit about that. But uh, from a consumption perspective, one of the groups of people that will not be using as much oil and gas as they normally would uh, will be state legislators during the 60-day session uh, now, whether folks from Roswell, uh, like yourself, would come back and forth to the Capitol in Santa Fe much during a 60-day session is uh, certainly one of personal preference and uh, professional responsibilities. But uh, the fact is, this will be a virtual session, uh, unprecedented so far as I know in New Mexico history. Uh, what is your take on that situation uh, in terms of how you'll be uh, representing the people and passing laws on their behalf during the next 60 days? Well, uh, let me answer that two ways. Number one, let's talk about Greg Nybert and, and his plans. And, and I think for, for most of my colleagues on the Republican side, uh, I think we are committed to uh, try to maintain as much normalcy as possible. So you will see me in my chair at the roundhouse on the floor, uh, uh, just like I have the, the prior two terms. And uh, the, the difference I understand, and it's over my objection, is that 
uh, I will have to participate via Zoom, similar to what we're doing here today, in lieu of being able to stand up and, and uh, be recognized and, and participate live on the floor of the house. It, it, it will be a virtual uh, session, even though I'm present in my chair. And I, I believe at least the Republican leadership and, and I believe uh, a number of my colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle will be actually on the floor and, and there in Santa Fe. Um, I don't know whether that'll be true with respect to the uh, majority party, whether they plan to be in Santa Fe or, or at their homes or wherever. Um, it, a lot of it's going to depend on the, the rule change, I suspect. But uh, let's talk a little bit about. Uh, well, can I jump in real quick there? Yeah. Uh, so the the building will physically be open to legislators. Uh, will staff be working in the roundhouse as well? Because you, you know, all have I'm, a lot of staff up there as well. I've heard that the committee analyst will not be in the building. I am assuming that my legislative assistant will be at her desk outside my office. Uh, I, I, I hope, <laughs> but uh, I guess I'll find out uh, next week. Uh, you know, the, the stuff that I need from a legislative assistant uh, because I'm not exactly a computer guru. You're, you're testing my technological uh, <laughs> limits here with, with this uh, video pre presentation. So um, I, I hope my legislative assistant is at her desk and that she can hand me uh, the, the papers and the materials that I need to be prepared for my next committee meeting. Uh, if all that's done virtually, I'm going to be at a tremendous disadvantage because I do not navigate uh, the computer maybe as well as I should. Um, so it's an unknown to me, but I'm assuming my legislative assistant will be there. Uh, I've heard that the committee uh, uh, folks that... Uh, you know, give us analysis of the bills and things. I've heard that they may be offsite, and that may just be uh, for the majority party. I, I don't, I don't know what uh, what Ryan Hadeen has scheduled for the Republican analyst. Whether they, he's planning them to be in the building or or not in the building. Uh, I don't know whether the speaker has any specific rules on their presence, but. Uh, <clears throat> For my two cents, I hope they're in the building because I appreciate face-to-face -face interactions a lot better than, than uh, you know, this remote stuff. Uh, with respect to the uh, proceedings themselves, it, it sounds like committee meetings will all be virtual. We will not be in our committee rooms. We will be on a computer uh, participating in those proceedings virtually. Um, the floor sessions will likewise be uh, virtual, even though a number of us will actually be on the floor. Uh, the, the Democrats have felt that, that it was a disadvantage for their members to be on Zoom while the Republican members were on the floor and were, you know, acting or going through the routine as they always have. Uh, standing up at their at their desk with the microphone, and the majority party felt that that was a disadvantage to their members. So I understand the rule change is going to force everyone to participate via Zoom, even if you're sitting at your desk on the floor of the house. Uh, I I don't like that, but. Uh, there's only 25 Republicans, there's 45 Democrats, and so you know where the, the vote's going to uh, uh, fall on that issue. Wow, um, that's very interesting. And do uh, you expect, or have you talked to many of your Republican colleagues or even some Democrats that might decide to uh, show up in person or, uh, how many of you do you expect will be there? Because of course that 
that's going to be an issue for uh, the powers to be as well. Well, of course, on on Tuesday at, at noon, a week from tomorrow uh, at noon, uh, the, the Democrats are going to have to have at least 36 of their members present on the floor in the House to, number one, uh, call the legislature into session, convene the legislature. They're going to need a quorum, so they, they're going to have to have 36 people there. And they're going to need 36 people there to vote on the rule changes that would then allow the virtual uh, proceedings to uh, take place. If, if they have less than, than 36, then, you know, maybe the rules don't get changed. And, you know, uh, I suspect that, that uh you know, if, if they have less than 36, that the rules would not get changed and that we would continue to uh, uh, meet uh, as, as we always have under the existing rules, which require physical presence in Santa Fe on the floor of the house. Hmm. Well, that's a pretty interesting setup. And I do want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, some of the issues that you'll be discussing and whether you really think we can have a full uh, session like uh, an in-person session would be. But uh, I know that one of your top legislative priorities and quite frankly, ours as well at the Rio Grande Foundation is doing something to rein in the governor's nearly unlimited powers under the emergency acts that uh, we've, we've seen in place since March really about 11th, that's when things got kicked off in terms of the COVID-19 situation. And I know you've got uh, bipartisan support, at least some support for uh, doing that, partially because, well, the legislature should have a seat at the table, I think, and, you know, not just as a conservative uh, free market guy, but in general, from a governance perspective, uh, it's hard to justify putting one person in charge of virtually all areas of government and expanding government power for 10 months, 12 months, uh, a year or more, uh, you know, where we are right now. So uh, tell us about those efforts to try to address some of the governor's unlimited powers. Well, it's been real interesting. Uh... As you know, Paul, I introduced House Bill 10 in the June special session and then House Bill 2 in the November, December uh, special session, uh, which, which essentially made the statement that the governor had to bring the legislative branch into, uh, into the mix when dealing with these protracted emergencies. And, and to date, the legislative branch has been completely ignored. Um, in fact, the judicial branch has had more interaction with this issue than, than the legislative branch. So the voices of the people from all corners of the state have not been heard. The only voices that have been heard are, are the governor and her uh, close circle of, of uh, uh, her cabinet. And while she does represent all of New Mexico, She's not on the ground in the various communities around the state, listening to the concerns that, that people have in the, in the four corners of the state. Uh, and, and so I have felt all along that not only does the legislature need to have a seat at the table with respect to public policy in connection with these extended emergencies, but that in actuality, we have a constitutional duty to the people to be at that table and to craft and to appropriate funds from the treasury to deal with the protracted emergency. And that has not occurred. So my, my, the bills I introduced in the special session, of course, went nowhere. Uh, they went to rules committee where they sat, never uh, received uh, uh, a hearing never saw the light of day. Uh, so after the June session, uh, Representative Eli uh, came to me and said, that's a 
issue that is worthy of consideration and that it needs to be taken up and that he would work with me before the uh, 60 day session in, uh, in 2021, if uh, both he and I were, were reelected. We were reelected after the election in November, he made good on his promise. And so since, uh, since November, we have been uh, working on trying to craft a bill that would meet my concerns and still uh, hopefully cut muster with the majority party. And, uh, you know, I've received some criticism that, uh, that, you know, people want this and this and this in the bill and, and, and you know, they want to make it where uh, basically the, the legislative branch uh, would then take over the operations of, of the uh, uh, orders. And, and, and frankly, that's not going to happen. Uh, the, you know, having to work with uh, a member of the majority party means that uh, they've got the votes and I don't. So I, I don't come to the table with a great bargaining position other than what I think is a very compelling reason. And that is a balance of powers issue and a constitutional role that only the legislature has. And, and that we are dropping the ball, we're not fulfilling our constitutional obligation to the citizens of New Mexico if we allow the governor to do everything. We have a role to play. So, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's what I can bring to the table, but in crafting the really, uh, you know, what is going to cut muster and get a majority. And frankly, Paul, it's going to have to be not just a majority, but it's going to have to be a super majority because in essence, we will be taking back some of the power that the executive has, has come to, uh, uh, I think she, she likes having that, all that power. And we're going to be taking some of that power back from her. She's likely to veto any legislation regarding this issue. So the way I've approached it is we not only need a majority, we need a supermajority that can withstand any gubernatorial veto of this legislation. So I, I can tell you that within 15 minutes of, of our discussion here, I've uh, exchanged some, some emails and, and tweaked some language in it uh, and we are, getting ready to send it to uh, legislative council service for a second draft of, of the bill. And, and essentially it gives the governor, uh, uh, you know, it still acknowledges that the governor has uh, the, the, the true role to play in dealing with emergencies. It's the executive department that has to uh, deal with the emergencies. Legislative branch is not designed to deal with the day-to-day -day operations of government. We set public policy. We do not do the day-to-day -day operations. So it acknowledges the governor's role. Uh, secondly, it gives uh, the governor's office uh, uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, and, and people may be upset, but uh, uh, it looks like uh, uh, 90 days is, is the time period that we're coming up with for the governor to uh, have an order in place. If the governor desires to extend an order beyond 90 days, then she must call the uh, legislative branch into special session, where upon the voices from the four corners of the state get to uh, become advised of the nature of the emergency, gets, get to uh, uh, weigh in on the public policy aspects of the emergency, get to appropriate the funds for dealing with the emergency and uh, can restrict, modify, otherwise uh, uh, deal with the emergency. And, and so that's, 
kind of the triggering event would be if the governor desires to extend an emergency as she has done every month for 10 months now, um, if she desires to extend it beyond uh, 90 days, then, then it will require the legislature to specifically to be called into special session to deal with, with the, the uh, uh, emergency. And uh, there's, there's two things that uh, uh, we are maybe moving forward on. Of course, not, nothing's set in stone right now. We're still negotiating, but uh, it, it looks like uh, we may have a bill and we may have a proposed constitutional amendment for the people of New Mexico to weigh in on this because some of the aspects of it cannot be done without a constitutional amendment. And it also means that the governor does not have a, an ability to veto a measure that is put on the ballot for vote by the people. So even if she vetoes and we can't override the veto on the bill, we have a backup for a constitutional amendment for the people to vote on uh, as well. So we'll, we'll see if we can get, uh, get a majority of, of both houses to uh, accept some of these ideas that, that uh, we've been bouncing around. And hopefully we, we come up with some, some suitable language that uh, causes a majority or hopefully a super majority of both houses to bite off on and to support. And, uh, you know, if we can get that accomplished, then I think we will be headed in the right direction. Well, thank you for taking this on. I know it's tough to legislate from a minority position here in New Mexico and hopefully uh, you get something that uh, both parties in the uh, legislature can uh, largely agree to and that the governor will either go along with it or that somehow you can overwhelm her uh, with numbers. Uh, it's a daunting task indeed. And, uh, you know, it's been singularly frustrating throughout this entire situation, how uh, the courts have ratified and reinforced her powers. But of course, the legislature had passed laws uh, in years past that were very expansive in their powers. And so no matter who the judge is, liberal Democrat or conservative Republican, it seems like uh, they basically had no choice but to read the law and um, get, you know, give the governor uh, as much leeway as she demanded or requested. I, I know as a lawyer, you, uh, you know, I'm sure you've at least considered this. I, you don't need to go into a lengthy uh, analysis of the the legal cases, but I'm I'm assuming you have the same general perspective. Well, I I have some real issues with uh, uh, the November decision the Supreme Court came down with. Uh, you know, the five thousand dollar fines that were upheld uh, against businesses that have nothing to do with healthcare. Uh, the, the, the Supreme Court seemed to bite off on the governor's interpretation that, that she could take all these emergency acts and shuffle the deck and use what she likes out of each one. And, and I have a real problem with that. Uh, uh, the $5,000 fine provision is only in the Health Emergency Act and that applies to health care and violations of that particular act. Um, <laughs> I just don't see where the Supreme Court got uh, got over the hurdle that it could then apply that five thousand dollar fine uh, to uh, other types of businesses. Uh, what, what I read in those other acts is they're they're subject to a hundred dollar uh, per day fine, uh, which is vastly different. So you know I have some concerns uh, with the with the decisions that have been made. And one thing that uh, uh, the representative that I'm working with and I are, are very cognizant of is that we need to make sure that this law or this uh, uh, revisions to laws that we're proposing is very clear so that the Supreme Court does not feel like it has the ability to shuffle 
the deck again and take what it likes out of each one of these acts. There's there's four different emergency acts, as you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know laws generally you don't get to pick one provision out of this law and one provision out of this law and then intermix them and, and uh, uh, you know uh, have the government act. It, it it doesn't work like that. So. Uh, we're, we're trying to be very cognizant of that issue and make sure that the language we put on paper is very clear and is very uh, well understood what our intent is. Well, yeah, very, very good point. And uh, I definitely will be happy to work with you in any way that we can to encourage uh, grassroots support for this kind of uh, legislation. So uh, please let us know when the bill is finalized and what we can do to help get uh, get folks to back it. It's a critically, critically important effort and uh, it really, I think it's uh, it could make or break any success that this legislative session might have. Now, uh, you know, moving on to some other issues, obviously there's a lot going on uh, in New Mexico. And, you know, I don't know if you have any specific priorities or if this has been uh, consuming most of your time, but uh, what other issues are you looking at during this session? Obviously a budget is, is important. Um, there, there's going to be a big push for new rules and regulations on our economy, possibly tax increases. What do you see happening and uh, what are your priorities during the session? Well, Paul, I guess my priority uh, has been and will continue to be, as long as I'm in the minority party, uh, playing defense and pushing back on uh, tax increases, pushing back on regulatory expansion, pushing back on uh, efforts that, that in my mind, uh, take more from the hardworking people of New Mexico and simply grow government. I, I am not a big government type person. I, I believe in individual responsibility and believe that uh, uh, maybe the least government is best. Uh, that unfortunately is not, uh, not how the majority feels and certainly uh, we are going to see with the additional progressives that have been elected to both the Senate and the House, probably more measures on increasing taxes, additional regulations, and growing government programs. Uh, in fact, uh, I think we, we've seen that the last couple of years. Uh, so, you know, it's always playing defense uh, from, from our perspective. So that, that's going to remain the priority for me and, and for my colleagues. And unfortunately, uh, the November election did not uh, do the things that I had hoped in getting us more numbers and getting us uh, more support to, to maybe push back on some of those measures and, and well, uh, I find that unfortunate. The people of New Mexico spoke at the ballot box and, and apparently they're satisfied with, uh, with that direction. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that I'm not going to continue to be the voice of the people in my district and try to push back on that. Um, personally, uh, uh, the bills that, that I'm working on, you know, the speaker said last week that he wants the the uh, members to limit themselves to five bills. That's never been a problem for me. I think we have enough laws on the books and, and, and am loath to, to pile on, although I, I sponsor a few bills each year. Uh, the, the main one is the bill that we talked about. Uh, there's, uh, there's actually two bills there, uh, one bill and one uh, uh, joint resolution. So that'll be two. Um, I do have a, a bill that, that I floated around, I didn't introduce last time, but an exemption for our farmers markets and 
moms who send cupcakes with their kids to schools and fraternal and charitable organizations doing an enchilada supper, exempting those organizations from the rules and regulations of the environment department so that people can sell, uh, do their fundraisers and sell their uh, food even if prepared in a, in a kitchen that does not comply with the environment department uh, requirements. Uh, ironically, uh, not many people who bake in their home comply with the environment department uh, requirements. Stainless steel, uh, can't have any pets in the kitchen, things of that nature preclude uh, that kitchen from being certified. So. Uh, the local issue here is that the farmer's market has not, uh, many people in the farmer's market have not been able to sell some baked goods and things uh, because of the environment department regulations. I would like to put an exemption in place that allows that to occur. And then some school, uh, some parents of school, school kids have said that they can't take cupcakes and, and stuff to their classroom to celebrate their child's birthday. And so just to make sure that it's clear, exempt those and then uh, fraternal and civic organizations allowing them uh, an exemption for periodic uh, uh, fundraisers, uh, such as a Qantas Pancake Day. Uh, they have that uh, quesadilla up in, up in uh, Berlin area. Uh, I'm not saying that right, but uh, I, I hear Kelly Fajardo and, and Alonzo Baldonado talk about it. And then, you know, you, you have uh, Elks Club, have enchilada suppers and things like that, trying to get an exemption so that uh, they can continue to do those things without interruption by the environment department. Um, another bill uh, of probably no interest to anybody, but other than a few lawyers would be, uh, I'm on the Uniform Law Commission. The Speaker of the House appointed me to that position. And there's one touch up bill for uniform laws that uh, that should be done and I'll sponsor that bill. And, and then uh, there's a oil and gas exemption bill uh, from the subdivision ordinance. Uh, along the state line in Southern Eddy County, if you look on Google Earth, along the state line, you'll see many gas plants that are virtually 100 yards south of the state line. They use an Eddy County road to access those sites, but the, the facilities are built in Texas. And, and when you ask why were those facilities built in Texas and why is Texas getting the revenue stream and the tax base increase off of those facilities. It's because in New Mexico, you have to go through the subdivision ordinance to, for a rancher to parcel off two acres, five acres, whatever, to an oil company to put in that gas plant. In Texas, they can do it, they, they can deed out the, the three or five acres and, and build their plant without any delay. New Mexico, you're up against a three month delay because you have to go through this process. And so I'm sponsoring a bill to exempt these oil and gas facilities from the subdivision ordinance that was really used to make sure that when you build a housing complex, there's sufficient government, I guess, planning involved so that uh, those things get done on the front end instead of getting caught uh, uh, without knowledge on the front end and, and having to scramble later on. So, so it's just a, kind of an, an effort to, to keep some things in New Mexico that are otherwise going to Texas and try to increase our tax base here instead of allowing the, the counties in Texas to, to secure those, uh, uh, those plants which bring in uh, money to their coffers. Um, that's, uh, that's about all that, that's on my plate uh, right now. I'm, I'm being pushed by some folks to sponsor a, a, uh, a bill to 
reinstitute the death penalty for for uh, killing children and maybe police officers. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to get that off the ground or not, but uh, it's certainly something that the constituents in my district and this part of the state would like to see because uh, uh, we, we see the heinous crimes against our youth and against, uh, uh, against these innocent children. And yet the, the uh, perpetrators just get slapped on the hands or, or get a few years in jail and, and, and are let go. Uh, that doesn't seem to be very just in my, in my opinion. So uh, that's, a, that's an issue that I think people down here would like to see. I, I tell the folks that uh, you know it has basically zero pat chance of passing uh, the legislature, but uh, there's some people that think it's worth the effort nonetheless. So how about uh, getting kids back in school? Uh, I know this is kind of a joint issue between the, uh, the governor, the legislature, and local school districts, but it would seem that uh, one of the issues involving New Mexico as it shut down, uh, where other states are, mo many of them are open, certainly other countries are much more open, uh, and yet our children are dealing with this virtual learning stuff. It's a, it's a real uh, challenge, to say the least, in a state that's already trailing uh, in educational outcomes. Do you think anything will be addressed or done in this session to um, do anything for the kids in, that are not being served by the school system? I, I think it'll be interesting to, to see uh, what the teachers union does in, in that regard, because my, my suspicion is that they are on board with the governor's actions in, in shutting the schools down. I find it to be uh, atrocious. And, and in fact, uh, I think the CDC uh, has stated that, that uh, children should be in school, that we should not be uh, uh, keeping our children out of school because of the, the so-called pandemic. Um, I, I know that down here, my local school districts, uh, want to be open, they want to be in session. Parents of the students want their children in school. They, they see their children falling further behind because of the uh, inability to be in the classroom setting with their teacher. Uh, and, you know, not only provides uh, educational benefits, but some of the social benefits that go along with uh, being in school. Um, I, I think it's a it's a travesty. I, frankly, I'm embarrassed that uh, the New Mexico Lobos and the New Mexico State Aggies are are having to uh, live out of state so that they can participate in in their athletic endeavors. Uh, it, you know, it's it's odd to me that New Mexico is is forcing uh, its team to go to Lubbock to uh, uh, compete, and yet, if I look at the numbers right, the uh, uh, the virus is as present in Lubbock, Texas, as it is in Roswell, New Mexico, or in Albuquerque. So, I, I hope I hope that there is some debate on that issue. We, of course, do not, uh, other than the the power of the purse. We do not have uh, uh, direct control over the public education department. That's an executive branch uh, uh, institution. But uh, I think you'll hear and see people weigh in on that issue and encourage the governor, encourage the secretary of education to open the schools up and to allow in school learning to once again transpire. Well, uh, do you see any anything specifically good happening uh, this session? I know it's a challenging, uh, you know, time in this state and in many ways in this country, and uh, we're pretty frustrated with the direction a lot of uh, 
things are going. And, uh, you know, I, it, it's pretty easy to look at the 60 day session and just say, uh, let's hope that nothing major happens with the exception of uh, restrictions on the governor's powers. But uh, it, it's, it's expected to be a tough session. But do you have any, uh, any sh silver linings here? Well, I think you started off with, with one of the silver linings and, and some people see it as a silver lining. Some people uh, don't, but uh, you know, the price stabilization in the oil patch is certainly a, a silver lining for New Mexico. Uh, we hear a lot of people say, you know, that New Mexico is, is too dependent on oil and gas and the money that it provides. And on the other hand, we hear that renewable energy is going to take uh, the place of oil and gas. And my challenge to my colleagues who, who make those statements is, okay, that's fine. We need to figure out a way then for those industries to start paying 40% of the state budget. And yet we don't see anything to try to tax, place a tax on solar power energy, wind power energy. And in fact, I believe that we are sending that power to California virtually tax-free. Uh, that is a real anathema to me and, and I find it to be objectionable. If they are going to replace the oil and gas industry and the production of oil and gas, then they need to, to start bearing their share of the expense of government. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm all for diversifying the economy. I'm all for, for bringing manufacturing jobs to Roswell, New Mexico. I'm all for, for growing uh, the economic base in New Mexico. Uh, but you can't say, on the one hand, we hate oil and gas and, and put in policies that are driving them out of the state. And at the other hand, and doing everything we can to bring in these so-called politically correct uh, uh, sources of energy and not have them pay their way. And still continue to have regulatory and tax schemes that discourage other industries that would diversify our economy from coming into New Mexico. Uh, you know, we can't have it both ways. We, we either encourage industry to come into New Mexico or we don't. And so far, we don't. The only reason why the oil and gas industry is here is because there's significant resources here and they have to go where the resource is. Um, if, if it were based on, on just the regulatory uh, scheme, oil and gas production would not exist in Colorado or New Mexico at this point in time. Uh, you know, I, I would like to see our, our tax, uh, tax laws get completely revamped and, and, and put in place. A, a taxing scheme that, that is fair to, to everyone, cut out a lot of the uh, exemptions and credits and this and that, and, and basically uh, allow, uh, you know, businesses to look at us more favorably than our surrounding states. And then likewise, hand in hand with a lot of other laws, uh, make sure that we have in place uh, laws that uh, encourage business development, encourage deployment of capital in New Mexico, encourage employment of New Mexicans instead of uh, putting up hurdles and barriers to uh, their entry. Uh, you know, why does it take companies months to get permits in New Mexico when, when they can get them in days in, in Texas? My one example, the gas plants along the, the state line. Uh, we need to look at all those things and make sure that, that we uh, put in place uh, competitive laws, competitive rules and regulations, competitive tax structures, competitive 
um, environment uh, so that our children have opportunities to live a better life than, than we're living. And I'm afraid that what we do as a state generally means that the life I've lived is gonna be better than the life my children are going to live in this state. And that's why one of my children have decided to move out, frankly. Uh, there were opportunities in, in an adjacent state that did not exist in this state. So that, that would be my goal. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time here today, Representative Greg Nybert from Roswell. And uh, we'll be seeing you virtually, I suppose, during the 2021 legislative session. And uh, best of luck and let us know how we can help with, uh, with that bill on restricting uh, the governor's unlimited powers uh, under the emergency laws of the state. And uh, with that, thanks for listening to this week's show. Make sure to get the latest edition of Tipping Point New Mexico by subscribing to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can post or comment on this and other episodes on Facebook and Twitter and tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path 3 Marketing for producing this show.